El Extraordinario. Extraordinario. Wait, wait, stop. What? Don't you want me to play it? First, I want us to explain to our listeners how we used Ursula's paintings to figure out the musical notes. You know, for the... Okay, sure. So, <laughs> all right. At first, you put forward the idea that the birds Ursula painted while she was in the psychiatric hospital might be musical notes. And we counted a total of 24 birds in her paintings, which is the exact number of notes that fit inside a bloom box. Yeah, and we figured that that was no coincidence. So the first thing we did was to change the order of the paintings. We arranged them according to their Latin names, which together form the phrase that is engraved on the box we saw in the photograph. Dum fixi tecui mortua dulce cano. That's it. So we put the paintings in that order. Yeah. And then I started to figure out how to interpret all those birds as musical notes. First, I tried drawing imaginary lines using the highest and the lowest birds as markers to delineate the staff to which I could add the birds later. But that didn't work. It didn't work. The birds weren't really in the right place. But I still tried to play the melody, and it sounded something like this. That doesn't sound very celestial. No. <laughs> It really doesn't. <laughs> so I started thinking about other ways these birds could represent musical notes, and that's when I noticed their colors. That's right. The birds are painted in a range of different colors, all very bold. Yes, and that made me think that each color might represent a note because, well, there are lots of techniques that use color to teach musical notation. Yeah, and it made sense that Ursula, who was also a painter, would play with something like that. The problem is that the pairing of the notes with color depends on the technique. Yes, and this is where we hit a brick wall. Because there was no way we could just guess the color code Ursula had used for the notation. But then I remembered what Christina had said about Kandinsky and how he associated music with color. The problem is, Kandinsky never actually specified the exact notes. No, he did not. Anyway, I got hold of his book Concerning the Spiritual in Art, And I read up on everything he says about the relationship between music and color. Yes, he talks about color and sound, and color and emotions, but there's nothing on musical notation, and I can't play the piano without notes, Mr. Kandinsky. <laughs> <laughs> We almost gave up. Almost. Until we found a paragraph where Kandinsky mentioned someone called Frau Unkowski, who taught music using colors. Kudos to me. Yes, but we couldn't find any information about her online. No, but luckily we didn't need to. That's right. Because who's the next person Kandinsky mentions, Amanda? Good old Scriabin. Exactly. The musician who wanted to change humanity with his masterpiece. Kandinsky says Scriabin created a chart that drew parallels between notes and colors. Right. We googled the chart, and it turns out Scriabin invented a keyboard with colored lights. The clavier à lumière. And there it was, on Wikipedia. A chromatic scheme with 12 keys and 12 colors. God bless Wikipedia. So Ursula must have known about Scriabin's work, especially since she was so close to Kandinsky and the Blue Rider group. And, well, at first glance, the colors of the birds match Scriabin's chart. We literally freaked out as we were preparing to play the notes in the same order as the birds in the paintings. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so shall I play it now? Yes, go for it. That's more like it. It's kind of weird, though. And a little hypnotic, don't you think? Yeah. I like playing it. Why do you think she hit the melody in the paintings instead of just writing it down somewhere? Mm, maybe she did. Maybe it was written on the pages that are missing from that notebook. Although I doubt it, to be honest. I'd say she was probably trying to hide it from her uncle or something, with the hope that somebody could break the code later on. That way she'd continue to sing sweetly even after her death, right? That's it. So now you want to try this melody on the music box. Where'd you say you'd found one? It's in a museum in Zurich. Yesterday I managed to track down the collector that owned the box that John restored. 
He told me he'd loaned it to the... The Museum for Gestalt. That's the one. It's not on show, but they have it in their collection. I've arranged to see it tomorrow. Oh, it sucks that I can't go with you. But they'll kill me if I skip rehearsal tomorrow. Let me know how it goes as soon as you play the melody, okay? Sure. Are you going to know how to program the notes? <laughs> yes, I think so. Shall we go over it, though? Alrighty. Okay, come over here. You need to make sure the notes are in the position that I've drawn here, okay? If you adjust the pegs using this chart, the melody should sound almost exactly like what I just played. Okay, got it. Just make sure they match. Based on Christian's video, Amanda shows me how to program the notes in the music box. Later, that afternoon, even though I try to follow David's advice and not let myself get carried away, I daydream about what might happen when I finally get to play Ursula's melody on the box. I've arranged to come to the Museum of Industrial Design, Architecture, Craft, and Visual Communication in Zurich. I'm meeting Sarah here at noon. Hi, are you Emma? Yeah, that's me. Hi, are you Sarah? Yes. I emailed Sarah and told her about my project, without going into too much detail. She knows I'm making a podcast about Ursula Bloom and that one of the music boxes they have in the museum was built by her cousin, probably with Ursula's help. Do you mind if I record this? It's for my podcast. Okay, sure, no problem. I arrive a few minutes before the appointment, so which gives me plenty of time to see part of the museum's collection. Yes. Thank but you. nothing they have on show prepares me for what I encounter when I step into the archive. This is the section where we store all objects that are not on display. It's a huge space packed with industrial storage systems between 13 to 16 feet high, lined with over a dozen aisles. Oh, this is super impressive. It really is, isn't it? As we walk I down one of them, we pass by museum. chairs, tables, lamps, so clocks. Who decides there are different models of each object. Museum. Some older, some more we contemporary. Team of At first it feels like I'm walking through a warehouse in a shopping mall, part of the but after a few seconds I realize it's more like being inside Noah's on Ark. A whole range of criteria. If we were to disappear from the planet tomorrow, a good part of the history of humanity could be reconstructed using objects from this museum. Here it is. This is the hallway where we store musical instruments. Follow me. Sarah stops in front of a mobile rack and activates the mechanism. A new aisle emerges to reveal a stunning collection of musical instruments, like a vault opening before our eyes. Well, I think... Uh, yes, here it is. This is... Is this the box? Yes, this is the bloom box. It's on a shelf, next to a selection of music boxes from different time periods. It's the largest item, and it's bigger than it appears in the restorer's video. It's... Stunning. Yes, it's really pretty. And it's nothing like the others. The box can play melodies with up to 24 notes, but but you already know all that, right? Yeah. Could I... Uh, when I emailed, I asked if I could try out a melody. Yes. I checked and they said that if you can tell me the melody, I can program it on the box. Is that okay? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, look. It's, uh, just a sec. Look, here, you need to follow these instructions. Okay, uh, let me see. Mm. Mm. Well, he... I think that should be it. And a little scary. <laughs> yeah. So, do you need anything else? Um, could I stay for a couple of minutes to listen to the melody? I'd like to record a bit more. If that's okay. Well, I've got to get back to work, but I think maybe you can come with me. Sure, sure. Of course. I follow Sarah over to a small room next to her office. There, separated by a glass partition, she goes back to work, and I listen to the melody over and over again. I felt kind of awkward. I'd pictured this moment so many times in my head. 
but I never expected it to turn out this way. Sarah doesn't quite understand what I'm doing, I'm sitting here in silence as I wind up the box again and again. I know this because she looks over at me every so often with a bewildered expression on her face. I told her I'm recording the melody, but that's not what's important. Listening to the actual melody is what matters. I managed to detach myself from the situation. I forget about Sarah and the soulless room I'm sitting in. And I focus on the box and how it plays the notes and its vibration. I listen to the melody, but nothing happens. The music has no effect on me. It's just a box making sounds. Are you sure you programmed the right notes? Of course I am. I made sure the woman from the museum marked them out like Amanda showed me. So, maybe it's not the right melody? I guess. Or maybe that box doesn't work? Um, could be. But didn't the restorer say it had been stored in a very damp place? Yeah. Well, that could be it then. I bet the dampness warped the wood, or maybe... <laughs> Why are you laughing? What's so funny? You're making fun of me. Oh, come on. When have I ever made fun of you? <laughs> Oh, I don't know. Loads of times? Right now, for instance? <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Um, I was pulling your leg a bit, but come on. Don't you think I would have liked the box to work and do magic or whatever? I know. Are you okay? Must have been disappointing. No, it's not just that. It's, um... Before I went to see the box, when I got to Zurich, I got a call from Christina and... And... <sighs> I'll play it for you. Listen. Hey, hi, what's up? Hi, uh, what are you up to? Is this, is this a good time? Can you talk? Yeah, yeah, I'm just on the tram making my way to the Design Museum in Zurich. Okay, I can't chat for long because I'm, I'm heading into a meeting, but I just checked the archive and I wanted to tell you about what I found. Sure, go for it. Okay, so I cross-reference mentions of events organized by the Choral Society with other news, and I've managed to identify almost all the men in the photo. Really? That's great. Well, I don't know if I'd say that's great. Remember the guy in the middle of the photo? The one that we thought was the director? Yeah. That's Hans Widmer. Widmer? The pharmaceutical guy? The owners of the hospital? Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, it makes sense. That's why they hired Ursula's uncle. I guess. The thing is, among the other names, I found Dashna, Leidenberg, Mais. Go on. They don't ring any bells? Um, uh, no. The first two are big German corporations, a pharma company and some laboratories. Uh-huh. And Mais is a huge international conglomerate. And you think there's something more to this? Yes, I do. I mean... Think about it. The owners of these companies were members of this tiny coral society. Yeah, I get you. Look, all those men are long since dead, but still, Emma, try and keep a low profile with your research, okay? Sure. All right. I've got to go. I'll speak to you later. Okay. And what do you make of all that? Well, if we follow Christina's hypothesis, the votes as day society became the Coral Society of St. Gallen and all the members came from wealthy families that ended up founding huge corporations. Yeah, so... So that would mean that we are dealing with a network of extremely powerful people. You think? <sighs> That's what it seems, at least. Yeah. Well, maybe a century ago they were all part of a... <laughs> a secret society, or whatever you want to call them, but... I doubt those companies are still connected. <sighs> I honestly don't know. For now, I'm going to focus on the boxes. I'm going to keep reaching out to collectors to see if I can find a few more. Not having much luck right now. <sighs> For a minute there, I thought it was going to work, you know? What was? The box in the museum. It's as if it was vibrating. If you stared at it long enough, the vibration seemed to make the ornaments come to life. I was very subtle. Did you record it? Yeah, yeah, of course. I made a really long recording of the box making sound. They should be in your inbox by now. Cool. Don't forget to record everything, okay? I don't forget anymore. Since that first conversation with the man who collected sheet music, 
I've kept my recorder on at all times. I continue to record even when I'm not interviewing anyone. I figure I can always go back to them if we need ambient sounds for the podcast. And thank God that I do. That same afternoon, after talking to David, I walked over to the Lion Monument. The sun was setting as I took a seat by the pond. I figured that I could record the sound of the fountain and then this happened. Hey, hi. What's that in your hand? A leaf? Is it for me? Oh, stop bothering that lady, come. Let's go and see the lion. So sorry about that. The girl that's come up to me must be about two years old. As the mother bends down to pick her up, the sleeves of her sweater slide up, leaving her wrists exposed. There are Greek letters written on one of them, and on the other, a longer phrase. It's in moments like this where I'm glad to be recording everything. That way, I'll be able to prove later on that this wasn't a hallucination. Clara? Um, do I, do I know? Are you Clara Torres? Yes. Um, have we met? It's a surreal moment. We're alone by the pond. Just Clara, her daughter, and me. The golden light of the sunset peeks out from between the clouds, and I ask myself again if I might not be dreaming. I've looked at Clara's photos hundreds of times before, but I don't think I would have recognized her had it not been for her tattoos. She's cut her hair short, and it looks nothing like her Instagram posts. But the biggest change is in her expression. She looks like a completely different person altogether. The conversation that follows is a little awkward. I can feel how Clara tenses up and becomes defensive. I worry that she's gonna leave at any moment, but in the end, I think curiosity gets the better of her, and she stays to hear me out. I try to explain how I came across her stuff, how I ended up in Switzerland researching the same things she did whilst trying to not come across as a stalker, which was no easy task. I stress that I come here almost every day and that bumping into her here was a mere coincidence, something I would never have anticipated. After telling her everything, as her daughter sleeps in her stroller, We walk over to a cafe, and Clara agrees to let me record her for the podcast. Hi, my name is Clara Torres, and I just want to clarify that my disappearance was completely intentional. Um, It was something I needed to do. I wasn't well at the time, and returning to London would have been like going back to square one. (laughs) Alex, David... I'm so sorry you were worried about me. And Lorena, well, I don't need to explain anything to you because you always got me. So, would you like to talk about what you've been doing these last few years? Um, sure. Well, I'm not gonna go into too many details. It's it's just that... Sorry, but I find this really hard. I don't like talking about myself. No, I get it. No worries. Anyway, let's just say I came here to research my PhD. I I met someone, I fell in love. We got married and had a baby. <laughs> I know it sounds pretty conventional when you put it that way, but it was a total reset for me. Like um like turning over a new leaf and starting anew. I stopped working on my PhD because it was having a serious impact on my mental health. Would you like to talk about your research? Not really. No. Um, I'm glad you're doing this podcast about Ursula Bloom. I think she was a great painter, and like so many other women, she didn't have the career or recognition she deserved. But... but all that stuff about her music. Listen, I get why you're hooked on her story. I mean... It happened to me too, but to be honest, not much of it is true. But Ursula... Look, I'm not saying Ursula Bloom was a fraudster. I'm sure she and the rest of her members had all sorts of supernatural beliefs. But that doesn't mean that they were true. It was a different era and people were more easily fooled than they are today. These things could have had a strong physical effect on you. But I think it was all down to the power of suggestion. 
I talked to Clara about this earlier. I tried to tell her about the boxes and the melody from the paintings, but she asked me to stop. She tells me she doesn't want to hear it because it only causes her harm. Nothing I say surprises her, and I can tell she probably came across the same things I did, and maybe even more. I ask her if she's been forced to keep quiet on the subject, and she looks back at me as if I've gone mad. <sighs> In the end, I drop the subject and stop insisting because the last thing I want is for her to get angry at me. I ask her if she regrets having done this research, if it's something she would like to erase from her memory. It's not something I regret, no. If I hadn't been so obsessed with Ursula, I never would have come here and I never would have met my husband and my life wouldn't have changed. I don't know, I guess... Sometimes we plan a journey and we convince ourselves that um, when we reach our destination, we'll, we'll, we'll find what, what we are looking for. But, um, but I don't know, but then we realize that in the end it was... It was, it was all just an illusion. You know? The voyage is what matters. Everything that you, that you experience along the way. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I get it. So, would you say you're happy now? <laughs> I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> yes, I am. I, I really am. I'm very happy. Clara leaves and I hang out at the cafe a little longer. As I watch her pushing the stroller in the distance, I remember what her friend Lorena told me. Maybe happiness for her was there all along, not on a faraway island or in yearning for the past, but on starting her own family. Perhaps that was her Ithaca. As I walk home to Amanda's, I can't help thinking that I'm also in the middle of a voyage of my own. But unlike Clara, I don't really have a destination. What is it I'm really searching for in this investigation? Am I also caught up in the same illusion as Clara? <sighs> Maybe I should take her advice and put a stop to it all. But unlike her, I still don't feel like I found what I'm looking for. Anyway, who knows? What if Clara didn't uncover everything? What if there's something she left out? What if there's something she didn't even try? have one new message. Received today at 3.28 p.m. Uh, hi, I'm Oliver Davis. Uh, you left me a voicemail a couple of days ago asking about a, um, a bloom box. And I think I have one like the one you're after. It's made of, well, well it's, it's wooden and has carved sides. It has a phrase engraved on the top. It's in Latin. Uh, it says, dum Dum vixi tat queer mortua dulce cano.